The Bible says in Philippians 2.8 that when Jesus came to be our Savior, he humbled himself and became a man. The most powerful one in the universe coming as the most helpless, dependent one. He was not helpless in the sense that he was God, but in his humanity, he was helpless. I really believe it was intended to show forth how we come to God. Jesus said, as you heard me say earlier, that unless we become as little children, we cannot come into the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean we have to be childish. It means we have to become like little children in our hearts. Children have a wonderful, humble way of believing. They know what faith is. They accept things without all of the stuff that we often put into the equation. The humility, simplicity, helplessness of a child pictures how we come to God. When we are saved, we say, Lord God, I need you. I can't get to heaven on my own. I need you to help me. I need you to be my savior. A few years ago, an international research group set out to determine just exactly what the average kid thought about Christmas. It should surprise nobody to hear that their survey found exactly 0% of kids hate Christmas. <laughs> only 1% said they only enjoy it a little, and the other 99% really, really like the holiday. The survey found that the thing the kids love the most about Christmas isn't the presents. What they really like is not having to go to school. <laughs> presents came in second, followed by spending time with the family, decorating the house, and eating all that candy. I've been amazed uh, over the years to realize how focused on children Christmas is. For all of our families, for our churches, Christmas is in many ways a child's holiday. And I have spent more than a few moments just thinking about it from the scripture. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born. If you were God, would you have had as your purpose to invade humanity that way? I think I would have just in Christ as a full-grown mature adult who could show up one day and become known as the Son of God and get on with it. But the Bible says that our Father in heaven chose to send the Lord of lords and King of kings into this world through the birth canal of a woman. God sent his son to us as a child. And when you stop to think about it and you sensitize your mind to that, it shows up everywhere in the narrative of Christmas. You know, Christmas is pretty much told in three chapters of the Bible, two in the book of Luke and one in Matthew. Matthew 1.18, now the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1.23, behold, the virgin shall be with child. Matthew 2.9, when the wise men heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Matthew 2.11, and when the wise men had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. Matthew 2.13, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother. Matthew 2.14, when Joseph arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came to the land of Israel. The story of Christmas is about a child and about a young child. Interestingly enough, one of the reasons we know that the wise men were not at the manger scene is because when you see the word child at the beginning of the story, that's speaking of Jesus as a baby. But when you get to the wise men part of the story, it's not child anymore, it's young child. They're two different words. The first word is a word for a baby. The second word is a word for a toddler. The Son of God came into the world, men and women, as a child. To think that God in heaven would send the Savior of the world to be born as a baby, that our Savior was sent to us as a child. And the hymn writers have caught this, several of them. One particularly that I love is, what child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch are keeping? This, this is Christ the King, 
whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him laud, the babe, the son of Mary. The hymn writer had this very same thought. What child is this? This is Christ the King. How do you put those two together? It's one of the mysteries of the Christmas story. So why did Jesus become a child? First of all, I think he became a child and he was sent here that way by his father to identify with our humanity. The author of Hebrews puts it this way. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the son also became flesh and blood. Jesus came to us to be one of us and he didn't show up as an adult. He came the way we came through birth to identify with our humanity. Max Licato imagines the moment that Jesus took on flesh and blood. He writes, he who was larger than the universe became an embryo. And he who sustains the world with a word chose to be dependent upon the nourishment of a young girl. God as a fetus, holiness sleeping in a womb, the creator of life being created. God was given eyebrows and elbows and two kidneys and a spleen. He stretched against the walls and floated in the amniotic fluids of his mother. He came not as a flash of light or as an unapproachable conqueror, but one whose first cries were heard by a peasant girl and a sleepy carpenter. God coming as a child to be one of us. It's very interesting to me that if you examine what it was like to be a child when Jesus was born, it wasn't a very good time for children. Children were not welcome. They were regarded as a burden. They were vexing. They were troublesome. Christ came to identify himself with the children of that day and the children of our day. And it's not an accident that the vast majority of the people who come to know Christ in our culture today, they come to know him when they're children. Did you know that? 75% of the people who become Christians do so before the age of 18. The message of the gospel is accepted and understood in the heart of a child. And as you follow the Lord Jesus through his earthly ministry, you will discover that children played a very special part in his earthly journey. In Matthew 18, we read that Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them. And he said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. And Matthew 19 adds, then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them and Jesus said, no, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus came as a child into humanity so that we would understand there is no one who cannot come to Jesus. Children come to Jesus. I know children who got saved in the third or fourth year on this earth and went on to live for Christ every day for the rest of their life. When you put Jesus in your heart, especially at the beginning of your existence on this earth, you set yourself on a journey that's high above any other journey you could choose. Choose Jesus and make sure your children know what it means to know Jesus. He came as a child so that every child would know him. And then he came not only to identify with our humanity, he came to illustrate humility. If you've ever held a newborn in your hands, you know there's nothing that pictures the helplessness and dependence of life more than that. And the Bible says that this is the way Jesus came. He came as a baby to illustrate that till we become like that in our spiritual being, we can't be saved. We have to humble ourselves. It's one of the hardest things about becoming a Christian for so many people because so many people want to think if it has to be, it's up to me. And they tell you about all the things they've done and all the things they've accomplished. But Jesus says, no, you have to come in the spirit of humility as a child and acknowledge your helplessness unless someone outside of yourself reaches down to take hold of your life. That's what God does when we come and accept his son as our savior. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 8, that when Jesus came to be our savior, he humbled himself and became a man. The most powerful one in the universe coming as the most helpless dependent one. He was not helpless 
in the sense that he was God, but in his humanity, he was helpless. I really believe it was intended to show forth how we come to God. Jesus said, as you heard me say earlier, that unless we become as little children, we cannot come into the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean we have to be childish. That means we have to become like little children in our hearts. Children have a wonderful, humble way of believing. They know what faith is. They accept things without all of the stuff that we often put into the equation. The humility, simplicity, helplessness of a child pictures how we come to God. When we are saved, we say, Lord God, I need you. I can't get to heaven on my own. I need you to help me. I need you to be my savior. The reason that he came was to show us his humility and to help us understand, unless we humble ourselves, we cannot go to heaven. I've had more than one occasion when I have had to talk to men, especially about their faith. And oftentimes when you talk to men about their faith, what they want to do is tell you about their accomplishments. We all have to have our list of accomplishments. Men kind of live on that. And I'm all for that. I think we should accomplish things in our lives, but your accomplishments can't get you to heaven. You have to be willing to put all that aside and say, in this realm, in this spiritual realm, I need God and I can't help myself. And when you come that way, God, he grabs hold of you like you wouldn't believe and lifts you up to the place where you want to be. So why did Jesus become a child? Secondly, what kind of child was Jesus? You know, there's not a lot of information in the Bible about Jesus from the time of his birth to his adulthood. A couple of incidents here and there. But we can find out about what kind of child he was by listening to a prophet from the Old Testament who gave us the prophecy concerning the child Jesus. For unto us a child is born, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Let's just take those words as words of description of the child Jesus. First of all, the Bible says he was wonderful. <laughs> I love that because in the original text, the word isn't wonderful, the word is wonder. Jesus was the wonder boy. He was a wonder boy. The Bible says everything about him was a wonder. It means that he was absolutely incomprehensible. Even as we have for years and years tried to figure out ways to explain it, to make it easier to comprehend. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, great is the mystery of godliness, God manifest in the flesh. He was wonderful in his birth because there was no other human being ever born like he was. God was his father. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit, and he was the only begotten son of God. A beautiful star led the wise men to his crib. Angels filled the sky on the night when he was born. Humble shepherds and learned scholars worshipped him at his lowly manger. He was wonderful in his birth. The manger of Bethlehem is exalted in the thoughts and affections of the world. Wherever the story is told, it remains. Just think of the wonder of it all. Christmas is Jesus enduring a human birth so that we could have a spiritual birth. Christmas is Jesus occupying a stable so that one day we could occupy a mansion. Christmas is Jesus having an earthly mother so that we might have a heavenly father. <laughs> Christmas is Jesus becoming a slave so that we could be set free. And Christmas is Jesus becoming poor so that we might be rich. Yes, what kind of a boy was Jesus? He was a wonder boy. Everything about him was a wonder. And then the Bible says he was counselor. And the word counselor is a word which means to advise or direct or to guide. And there is a special, special story in the New Testament that illustrates this. One of the stories that I've always loved about Jesus is the story when he was taken to the temple as a young child and then his parents forgot him there. I've always loved that because I have done that to my children <laughs> on more than one occasion. And my parents did it to me. It's an emotional thing you might not ever get over if it happens very often. But listen to me. Jesus went to the temple, and three days later, his parents hadn't caught up with him yet. And finally, the scripture says they went back to find him, and they looked all around and couldn't find him. And he wasn't in the normal places where children would be, and so they went into the temple proper. And let me show you the verses that describe what happened. This is right out of the book of Luke. 
Now, so it was that after three days, <laughs> I love that, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions, and all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. Why, you should be astonished at that. He's the wonderful counselor. That's what the Bible says. He's the counselor. And then the Bible adds this third one, and this might be the most overwhelming one to all of us. The Bible says, mighty God. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Imagine giving name to your child and then sending out the birth announcement, welcome baby, Mighty God. <laughs> At Christmas time, we often speak of Jesus as the sweet baby Jesus and that he was. We love that part of the story. He was that. We share it widely. When Christ was born in Bethlehem, the Jewish nation was not interested in a sweet baby Jesus. They wanted a deliverer. They wanted someone to sit on the throne of David and become their king. And it is interesting that one of the names that Isaiah gave to Jesus before his birth was El Gippor, the strong one, the God of strength, the mighty God. Now, a lot of those who try to say that Jesus was not God struggle with this because this tells us who Jesus was. He was God. The Bible, according to Isaiah, says he was the mighty God. Who was that Christ child born in Bethlehem? That was God in a body. It was God in the manger. There is a line in Mary, Did You Know, the great song that was written not so long ago. I love this phrase. Every time I hear this song and hear this particular phrase, my heart kind of jumps. Here's the phrase, and when you kiss your little baby, you have kissed the face of God. Oh my goodness. Friends, if we don't understand this, and especially at this season of the year, if we don't nail this doctrine down, Christmas is nothing more than a wonderful pageant that brings people together at the end of the year. But if it is true that the mighty God is in the manger, then he would grow up to manhood, live a sinless life, ultimately go to a cross and hang there, dying between two thieves. This is God on the cross, paying the penalty for the sin of the world. This is not just a man. If God is not in Christ, then his death on the cross is no more meaningful than if I were to die on the cross for you. You see, if someone were to come to me and say, hey, your friend committed a terrible crime, he's going to die for the crime, but you have the right to die in his place. If I died in his place, you know what? My dying days are over. I can't die for anybody else. But Jesus died for the whole world. Jesus was God, and because he was God, he was infinite, and his death was infinite, enough so that it covered the death of all who would put their trust in him, including you and me. The Bible says the wages of sin are death, but that payment's been made. Almighty God made that payment in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, and that's what's so wonderful about knowing Jesus. It's the whole wonderful truth of our forgiveness because God loves us so much he sent his own son to pay the penalty that we deserve. How can it be said that the one who was born in the manger and hung on the cross could pay the penalty for the sin of the world? The only way that can be true is if the one who was born in the manger was El Gabor, the mighty God, and he was. That's why we rejoice at Christmas. If we know what we're rejoicing about, the child was God. Did those two things seem hard to put together? They always have been. But never forget it, the child was God. Would you say that with me out loud? The child was God. That's the most important thing you can remember about Christmas. And then the Bible says, everlasting father. He is wonderful. He's the counselor. This is who the child was, everlasting father. Now, this is stretching your mind, I know, a great deal. But here we have the child being the father. How does that work? Well, it was a troublesome thing all through Jesus' life. On one occasion, he got into an argument with some theologians. He said to one of those who were interrogating him one day, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. In other words, before Abraham ever lived, I was living. He was the child, but the Bible says he was the father of eternity, which means he wasn't the father in the sense of being God. He was the ultimate source of eternity. Almighty God, through Jesus Christ, created us for eternity, and the Father of eternity is Jesus Christ. That means when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, eternity is a part of the package. You get to live forever with him in heaven. Please don't be misguided in the Christmas season that Jesus Christ began at Bethlehem. 
He did not begin at Bethlehem. He came into the flesh at Bethlehem. There's never been a time when Jesus was not, and there never will be a time when he ceases to be. He is the eternal Son of God. He has lived forever and will live forever. But for a moment of time, he entered this world to become one of us, to identify with us, so that he could be our representative on the cross and pay the penalty which we deserve. We rejoice in this day that the Christ who was born in Bethlehem is El Gabor, the everlasting father. And then here's the one we love the most, the fifth name given by Isaiah for the child. He is the Prince of Peace. Oh, how I love that. Our world has known so little peace. In fact, I have some diagrams in my study showing how many years there have been where there has been no war, and it's almost none. Even now as we gather here, war is breaking out in different places. Some of it we see, some of it we don't. The Hebrew word for peace here is a word we all know. It's probably the only Hebrew word most of us know. It's the word shalom. If you were a Hebrew growing up in Jewish culture, that was the word high. You'd see somebody in the street, you'd say shalom, peace. All the peace they longed for in the Old Testament never happened. All the peace they longed for in the New Testament before Christ, it didn't happen either. And then one day, to a group of shepherds, peace was announced. Listen to this. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Peace was born at Bethlehem in the person of Jesus Christ. Peace was wrapped up in that child because he was human and divine, because he was God and man. He could reach up one hand and take hold of the Father, reach down another hand and take hold of us and bring us together at the nexus of the cross and create peace between us who were at enmity with one another. We were violating his standards and there was no way we could make peace with that. One of the antonyms of peace today that is so much felt among us is anxiety. Peace is the opposite of anxiety. Anxiety is running wild in our world because of inflation, because of war, because of COVID, because of all the things. Anxiety is pretty much at the top of the list for counselors. But did you know the Bible says that when you take Jesus Christ into your life, you take into your life the Prince of Peace, and he can give you peace that will overcome the anxiety of your life. When you know all is well with God, and he is in heaven, and heaven rules, you can walk each day in the midst of the craziness in which we live today, and be at peace with yourself, and be at peace with God. Once again, Isaiah the prophet said it this way, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement for our peace was on him. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. This week, I watched a video of Walter Cronkite reading one of the most remarkable Christmas stories. You see, this story is about something that happened during a time of war. World War I ravaged the continent, leaving destruction and debris in its wake. But from the midst of the dark conflict comes the story of the Christmas truce of 1914. The Western Front, only a few months into the war, was a deplorable scene of devastation. Almost as to give the combatant one day to breathe again, a truce was called from Christmas Eve through Christmas Day. No fighting, no war, from Christmas Eve through Christmas Day. As darkness settled over the front like a blanket, the sound of exploding shells and gunfire faded. Faint carols in French or English voices on one side and in German voices on the other rose to fill the silence of the night. Can you imagine? By morning, soldiers at first hesitantly began filing out of the maze of trenches into the dreaded and parched soil of no man's land. There was more singing. Gifts were exchanged between the soldiers they were shooting at a few moments ago and were now shaking hands with and conversing with. For one brief but entirely remarkable day, there was peace on earth. Events like the Christmas truce are worth celebrating, and Christmas itself can do that for a war. But celebrating Christmas can't do for you what you need. You have to celebrate the Christ of Christmas. 
you have to get past the celebration to the person. You have to take Christ into your life and accept him as your Lord and Savior. You have to believe the story that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that includes all of us, will put our trust in him. We won't perish, but have everlasting life. Have you done that? Have you actually asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to look over your life and realize someone is missing? That someone is the Lord. If you're not a Christian, if you've never invited Christ into your life, you can't know this peace that he came to bring. He wants to be your wonder, your counselor, your mighty God, your everlasting father. Most of all, he wants to be your prince of peace. He comes when you invite him into your life. This verse, this promise, this wonderful encouragement, this motivation for the new year is for those who love God. So the question I need to ask you today, are you a God lover? No, don't just tell me you believe in God. No, God lovers are those who have taken God's wonderful gift of eternal life to the